Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to come as a surprise, but several centuries ago, the term loyal opposition was coined because why? You had to defend the non-governing parties who were criticizing the governing cabinet from accusations of treason and, and then subsequent beheadings, okay? That, people saw that as a career problem, all right? <laughs> So they pledged adherence to the source of authority for the government. And our speaker today uh, participates in that centuries old tradition on a daily basis on behalf of everybody in Illinois down in Springfield. Because uh, the kind of airing of alternative views, of differences of opinion, and the subject of those ideas to debate and to public question is a lot like the City Club itself. And that's why all of us are so happy that we could get on the schedule of our Republican leader in the Illinois State House of Representatives. Biggest welcome of all for Tom Cross. Ladies and gentlemen. Wow. I guess we'll open it up to questions. I'm not sure Eddie Sullivan, did you get introduced? State Representative Eddie Sullivan. It's also good to see Lee Daniels as our former leader and speaker here. Lee, good to see you. You did. Lee took us through some very difficult times with this state, and he did an excellent job in uh, working through the process and with different governors. And we are, owe a lot to, a lot of thanks and gratitude to what he did. I uh, want to spend a little bit of time talking about what I think will be um, an interesting veto session and then it open, up, open it up to any questions you might have. There will be a variety of issues that we'll talk about uh, just because of action we took uh, this past spring. Gaming will be on the uh, agenda. Uh, we may see something with McPeer. We will have to deal with things uh, with the, that the governor did with respect to the budget and how we handle that. So those items will be there as, as will um, the issue of smart grid. You happen to have some uh, folks involved in the room here with that. I happen to think uh, that we ought to override the governor and get that done. It's something we need to do in this state. It's something we need from an infrastructure standpoint and we need to do it and move forward. So I happen to think and I believe that we have a good chance of doing that and it's uh, something we will certainly act on in the fall veto session. So I believe that uh, uh, those are kind of the, some of the, the main topics. But I want to talk about some other issues that I think we ought to talk about in the veto session. As I see it, and I suspect uh, you all understand this to a degree, there are three primary topics that are the center of attention or should be the center of attention in the state of Illinois, both in the veto session as, as we move forward. It involves the budget, it involves jobs, it involves the pension problem that we have. And with respect to the budget, we had a, the start of a fairly good process and result in this past session. I would argue that uh, the last 10 years have not been good for us. Our friends on the other side of the aisle did not include the Republicans and they have certainly that prerogative as a general rule and we spent significantly more money than we took in year in after year out and we found ourselves in a very, very significant hole that's gonna take some time to get out of and that's just the reality of the situation. But this year for the first time in a while we worked with the speaker uh, in, in the House. And to put this in perspective, you need to know the numbers we were talking about and where we ended up. The, the governor came in and said he wanted to spend approximately 35, between 35 and 30 half, 35 and a half billion dollars. The Senate Democrats wanted to spend a little over 34. And in the House side, we said, why don't we keep it to 33.2 billion dollars? The uh, rough estimates were that we would see as a state for the 2012 budget year, about $34 billion. We wanted to err on the conservative side, and the reality is it's a good thing we ended up erring on the conservative side of $33.2 billion because it now appears that in the best case scenario, we'll be about $500 million above that, not the extra billion. But the idea was to come in low, uh, have sufficient money that we had some, not just necessarily wiggle room, but at least have some money to start paying down our bills. So as a result of that, we came out of the House with a 33.2 budget, went over to the Senate, ended up on the governor's desk, and for all practical purposes, with this certain exceptions and his vetoes, he reduced a couple items to the tune of two or three hundred million dollars. We ended up with a budget around 33.2. Now, is it a perfect budget? No. Uh, could we have done more? Yes, in the area of cutting, but it is a start. 
And it is a start of something we need, in my opinion, to make a permanent way of life as a general assembly of living within our means, not spending more than we took in, and starting to find more ways to run efficient government and also finding ways to reform. One of the highlights of this year's budget, and I give Patty Bellock, member of our caucus, a great deal of credit, is we did some significant things in the area of Medicaid reform, a very, very difficult area, one that does have negative impacts in certain segments of our society and certain uh, segments of uh, the business community, the hospital community, but we, we addressed some very difficult issues, and Julie Hamos, to her credit as well, did a very good job embracing those changes and pushing those changes. But at the end of the day, it's a start. It's far from where we need to end up. We're going to have to do this year in and year out of living, in with, living within our means, and I'm hopeful that we can do that. But the issues beside budget are, are, are jobs and pensions. And I think it, there are two issues that we need to look at in the veto session, because the longer we put them off, the longer we ignore them, they get worse and worse and worse. And I think anybody in this room knows, wherever you go, people are talking about jobs. People are talking about the economy. People are talking about the climate, the jobs climate in the state of Illinois. And when I run into people, whether I'm at the grocery store somewhere in my district, I can be at church, I can be at work, wherever it is, people want to know what are we doing about it. Not are you can it get me a job, but they're worried about, they're scared, and they're frustrated, and there's fear, because they're worried about whether they're going to keep their job, whether they're going to have a job tomorrow, and is Illinois going to get us act together and make sure that we have a climate that is conducive to business. I think on this particular topic, with respect to jobs, there's a difference of opinion between the two parties on how we create a significant and a, and, and a, a, a strong business climate. The Democrats, and, I, and I'm not going to make this partisan, but our, our friends on the other side, took a different route than we would have taken. They said, we're going to raise taxes, not just on individuals, but on the corporate side as well. And then the next thing they've done is, subsequent to that tax increase, they've said, we are going to pick and choose who we help from a tax incentive standpoint. Maybe the people that yell, yell and scream the loudest, we're going to go help them. We, on the other hand, would say, you need a broader approach. You need to spend less, you need to tax less, and that you need to have a broad-based policy with, respects to, with respect to tax incentives and economic development. Imagine this state if we had a broader-based approach and we had a decent regulatory system and we had a decent litigation system and a decent work comp system, what that would do to the environment and the mindset of business folks and individuals. It's clearly not working the approach that has taken place since the tax increase. All you have to do is look at the facts. We were at 9.9 .9 in unemployment in the state of Illinois. That number has risen almost a point since January where the tax increase went into place. 9.9. .9. We have lost over 105,000 jobs since January. Illinois is the second highest state unemployment-wise in the Midwest. And within the last two months, we've lost more jobs in this state than anywhere in the country. It's not working. It's not working. And with all due respect to our friends on the other side, we have got to take another approach to creating a broad-based approach and looking at how we can, again, send a message that we get it with respect to business. We are a great um, sports town. And to use a sports analogy that I think we will all get, we are playing defense every step of the way with respect to jobs. And everybody knows, regardless of your favorite team, whether it's the Cubs, the Sox, the Bulls, the Hawks, wherever you want to look. You cannot do well, you cannot prosper if all you're doing is playing defense. We don't have the ability at this point to put any runs on the board. We've got to change the playing field. So what we said is what can we do from a business standpoint to level the playing field and provide some opportunity um, from a business standpoint in the state of Illinois. Now, what I'm going to talk about are five things that I think will help the climate. I'm not at all naive to the fact that we also need to get our act together on the budget, get, get our act together with respect to the pension. It's a whole picture that we have to focus on because it's not just one component. But with respect to the jobs, we said, what's something we can pass in the veto session? What's something that we can do that makes us competitive with the states around us? What's something that we can do that we can send a message to the business community that we are slowly but surely as a state getting it and providing, again, that broad-based tax incentive that we need to do? There are five things we did and, and that we have offered and we filed and we, we're ready to go with them in the veto session. The first thing we said is, if you want to start a new company, and we, we reached out to some of the universities 
um, in, in, the, in the state, the University of Chicago being one, the University of Illinois, as we put this package together. And none of this is earth shattering. We, we've, there's some things we've done before. The Democrats have supported some of these things. But small thing maybe to people in this room, because you're all in many cases involved with big companies. Start, cost you, cost you $750 to incorporate a business in the state of Illinois. If you go to Indiana, Missouri, Wisconsin, Indiana, costs you as little as 100 to maybe $50. If you're a startup company, I would believe, and I think you would, would agree with this, that you would much rather use that $650 to help start up your new business than sending it down to the Secretary of State's office. So simply, simply said, startup companies, brand new corporations, we're going to lower your fee to $100. Second thing we said is, in the area of research and development tax credits, something we've done in this state, off and on, it's kind of a hodgepodge, but what happens in Springfield is the business community has to come down and make sure that we can get it extended year in and year out. That doesn't make any sense. Why don't we make that a permanent uh, tax credit for research and development? So if you're Abbott Labs, or you're John Deere, or you're Caterpillar, you can plan and provide some certainty in your planning of the research and development you want to do. Everybody knows, again, every state around us provides research and development tax credits. Everybody knows it works. And it provides some incentive for those companies. It infuses money into the economy here in the state of Illinois. The third thing we say is we're about to lose enterprise zones. Enterprise zones are created around the state in certain communities that provide businesses with tax breaks. And they have been a source of economic development around the state, from Rockford to Waukegan to Southern Illinois. They are about to expire. Every state around us utilizes enterprise zones. We simply say let's extend this for another 20 years so we can take advantage of enterprise zones. Fourth thing we say is Oftentimes, companies in, in tough times or startup companies have losses in a year. It happens. And so we used to have in our tax code the ability to carry those losses forward. So it was recently repealed. It's a significant, um, I think, break from a business standpoint, big and large, to allow that carry, carrying forward of those losses. And we would suggest that. And then the fifth thing we say is in the area of estate taxes. Ill most states around us, with the exception, I think, of Indiana, do not have a state estate tax. They end up, you will end up paying an estate tax at $5 million, the federal government kicks in. So we said, why, do you, why should a family farmer, a small business owner, medium-sized business owner, depends on where you are, have to sell their assets because they hit a $2 million figure in the state of Illinois. Ours kicks in at $2 million. We decided to kick it up to five. Now, those are the five things. They are um, maybe in your minds not all earth shattering, but under our analysis and working with universities around a couple around the state, we can knock unemployment down by a percentage point. We can put 60,000 new people to work, and we can create a revenue of about six to seven hundred million dollars. And I think it, most importantly of all, sends a message that we get it, and we're going to do what we can to give a little jump start here in the economy. Is it everything we would want on our side? No, we would have been more aggressive. We perhaps perhaps would have said no to the. Uh, a state tax at all in the state of Illinois. We would have said, we don't like the idea of the corporate tax, but we need to work together. We need to pass something. This is something that is practically and realistic and Democrats have supported in the past. And imagine if we could actually create 60,000 new jobs, unemployment going down, people wanting to stay, people saying, all right, you're finally slowly but surely getting it instead of just picking and choosing. So I'm hopeful that in the veto session we can get this done. I've sent a letter to the speaker, the president and the governor and said this is a priority. Uh, with all due respect, it's not working, and we need to do this immediately and not wait and have committee hearing after committee hearing and, and, and actually uh, implement that it. it's something we can do, I think, soon. The second issue that I think is the issue of the day, not that jobs aren't important, not, uh, not that jobs, jobs in the economy and not that uh, the budget's not important, we've got, to, we've got to deal with pensions. I think everybody in this room knows the drill. We've talked about this um, for a while. Uh, I give the Civic Committee a, a lot of accolades for for pushing this issue because it is very real and it is consuming us and it is smothering us. And if we do not address the issue of pensions as a state, we will be, we will be so overwhelmed and overburdened with financial commitments that we may not be able to get out of it. We have at, at best, or at the, the best case scenario, an $85 billion unfunded liability with respect to pensions, 85 billion. Some would tell us that we're low on that because of assumptions of earning eight to eight and a half percent of money on our money, it ain't gonna happen. So we're at, at, as I said, at best 85. So to put this in perspective, we have an unfunded liability of 85 billion, and we have a schedule that uh, was put in place back in 95 that we're gonna reduce that unfunded liability. All our pension systems, there are five of them. Five of them 
are about 37 to 38 percent funded. So we've got, a, we've got a payment schedule that we've got to adopt. By year, year 2045, that payment will be $20 billion. We will surpass Medicaid, we will surpass education, it will be our number one, our number one appropriation out of the budget. We can't put it off. And it's an uncomfortable conversation to have because you're saying to people that are in the system, we, we're going to want to change this, but if you want a pension system and you want it to be there and you want it to be stabilized, we have to have this conversation. Once again, it's one of those things like jobs that we can't put off any longer. Every year it gets worse. So we had a budget this year at 33-2 and a lot of accolades to members of our caucus and on the Democrat side, they cut. Again, could have been, some will say you should have done better and we, we, I'm sure we could have done better. But next year, as we move into the next budget year, we will have an increased pension payment of another 500 million with additional growth in Medicaid. It's not gonna go away. Something we need to do yesterday. The other thing that we need to do in the area of pensions, only in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois, can you start working, and kudos to the Tribune and the w WGN for, for picking this out, and I think this story continues, only in Chicago, and thank you to the state of Illinois, can you start working with the city of Chicago, take a leave of absence, go work for a union, and then come back and retire on that union salary that's significantly higher than the state salary and retire under the city pension. We can't afford it. And you're not putting in money under that scenario to even come close to justifying the city pension that you're gonna get. We filed uh, a week ago an ability, a, a bill to repeal that 1991 law. I, I'm not sure what all happened back then. It's, it's over, it's time to move forward. We need to repeal that so you can no longer take advantage of a law that allows you to retire under a city pension at a, at, a, at a union salary. It makes absolutely no sense. The other thing that we are, um, Adam, thank you. The other thing that we found in that, in that story was that there were folks that were coming to the city, that were working for unions and filed documentation that was falsified, that said they did not have at the time a union pension and they wanted to collect on the city pension. What, the, what we ultimately found out, or the papers found out, and the WGN and Tribune found out, was that the pension systems, the, the local board said, well, we've, we caught you on this. We, we realized the documentation was falsified. We're not going to do anything about it. We're going to still let you collect your city pension. You, you can't let this, in our opinion, go on. So we're going to file two other bills today that do two things. I think we should reconstitute all of the city and county pension boards. There uh, needs to be some accountability, and we can do that through the mayor's office, we can do that through the county board president's office. So what we would do for the cities is make them all seven member boards, four appointed by the mayor, two have two em current employees and one annuitant. Similar to what we did at the state level, but it needs to be, there needs to be full accountability on how these boards deal with pensions. There's a great deal of money involved with them, to say the least. And the other thing we would say is that if you're on a pension board or employee of those pension boards, and you're aware of any improprieties or illegal activity or falsified documents, you have an obligation to turn that over to your local law enforcement agency. So we, um, working with Matt Murphy on that, on those two bills, he's taken up the charge in the Senate, and uh, a number of our members are helping us out on the House, and I appreciate their support uh, as we move forward on pensions. As I said, I think those are the three big topics uh, of the day, but I think from a veto standpoint, we need to look at, um, as quickly as we can, both pensions, on an overall standpoint, in a substantive way, and also the job thing. As I was, as I was finishing up here, and I'll be glad to open it up to questions, I, 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 and, and I, we're all out speaking, and I, I, I realize this is not a positive speech, because there's not anything really exciting to talk about. And we as elected officials over the years have talked about all the things we're gonna do, and how we're gonna help people, and how we're gonna spend more money on this, and spend more money on that, and we've gotta do this. Well. We did that for way too long, and there's an expectation for many of you that those are the types of speeches you're gonna get. Well, we can't do that. We've got some very, very, very difficult times ahead of us. And Chris Christie recently talked about the difference of the need to, what we, what we go through a lot of times is talk about comfortable, have comfortable conversations that really aren't true, comfortable lies, versus the need to talk about difficult things and be truthful. I think he's dead on. It's difficult to have the difficult conversation and, and be truthful. No one wants to have the talk about pension reform. It's very, very difficult. Our members have heard from thousands of teachers and state workers and they're very angry about it because they say we've done everything 
you've wanted me to do. It's very difficult to cut a budget because it has impacts on people. But these are all things, the good news about these issues, if there's any good, is that we know the problem. We know, that the, we know the path of the tornado. We know the train's coming. We can address them if we're willing to have the difficult conversation. As Winston Churchill said uh, right before World War II, it's not action I'm worried about, it's inaction. And if we do nothing on these three issues and don't stay diligent and focused and persistent, we'll never get out of this mess. But we can do it. I, I, I do think we can do it. We know a path out of there. We just have to be resolved and be confident and be willing to make some very, very difficult decisions and have some very, very difficult conversations. And I think for the next few years, being a member of the General Assembly in the state of Illinois is not gonna be easy. And I think our members understand that and I, I appreciate that because it's tough at home when you have to have all these conversations. But it's time to move on. It's time to have the conversation. And if we have it, and we make those difficult choices, we can make Illinois a strong state again. It can be a state we're proud of. It can be a state that's no longer the butt of late night jokes. We all get tired of that. It's our state. None of us are leaving. We don't want to leave. And we have to make it a state that, that, that works. So with that, thank you for your interest in state government. And I uh, appreciate your interest in being here today. And I will be glad to try to answer any, any questions you have. I would say this. If there are any very difficult questions that I don't know the answer to, Matt Murphy is a very capable state senator. <laughs> and I am going to ask him to answer very, very difficult questions. Because Matt Murphy, leaders lead. Okay, get your, get your questions in. You want me to read them? Right, let's see here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hold on one second. Well, if I don't like we, it. We, uh, be sure to write your name down so that we can identify you. Will the... Will the governor sign the, maybe it could be like Carnet. Will the governor you, sign the gambling me? bill? Dakota Schultz, will the governor sign the gambling bill and help create tens of thousands of new jobs in Illinois? He's given every indication he's not gonna sign the gaming bill. And I, I know that uh, President Cullerton is trying to find out what exactly he's looking for and what he likes and doesn't like and try to find a, kind of a compromise, if you will, in a new bill or in a trailer bill. I don't think that uh, John has been able to figure out quite yet where the governor is, so at this point, my bottom line answer is I'd say no. <laughs> See how easy it is? Richard Johnson, if the tables were reversed with Republicans controlling both legislative houses, how would redistricting be different? <laughs> There'd be a different map. Good question, but there, there would be a slightly different map. Any other questions? <laughs> Wolf, oh, Kent, Kent Griffiths. Chicago voters are getting wise to crony capitalism. How do you define it? How do, how do Madigan and Cullerton practice crony capitalism? <laughs> Kent, you know, the speaker and I are now BFFs. And, uh, <laughs> and I... Um, I, I want to remain BFFs, at least through veto session. So um, can, you, can I answer this question at another time? Why don't you give me a call? All right. Anything else? Mark Wire, Wire Mute Moulton. What are your thoughts on Tea Party movement and who do you like the Republican presidential nominee? You're, you know, a lot of, you get a lot of criticism about the Tea Party. I think the Tea Party's, what I like about it is it's, it's in many ways they force the issue on some conversations that I said earlier we have to have. Uh, whether it's spending, whether it's on pensions, um, whatever the case may be from a budget standpoint, I think, I think it has helped drive the, drive the issue, um, drive the issues that, that we need to discuss. We can't sustain what we've been doing. And so I, in that respect, I think it's extremely positive. And uh, politically, they've been, you know, they've been very helpful in, in other states, and I think to a certain degree, not to a certain degree, a large degree, they've been helpful around here in certain, in certain segments. So, um, good question. Can you do that one? Which one? The one from before. Oh, yeah. Since July 1st, the state has cut addiction treatment by over 20%. Is there any, are there any options available to restore the cuts in October and January? So, this, is the, this has been a problem with other areas where we've cut, and I think the general approach will be that we have $33.2 billion to spend. I know that we're not interested and in willing to go over that number, but within the confines of that number, 
if we can make, find some other cuts, and in certain specific areas, um, th that's certainly a conversation that people may be willing to have. I, I, but, I, but I would stress, you're not going to, and I think the speaker, if he was here, would say the same thing. You're not going to see people go over that 33-2 figure, at least on the House side, at least from the speaker's standpoint in mind. It's a matter of whether there's some adjusting in that, in that number of 33-2. Will you present a bill to change downstate police and fire pensions to return control of the pension bond, pension boards to municipal control? You know what? Can we get through the state budget first, pension issue first? I, I realize that, that, that this is a, an issue and I'm not, I don't mean to make light of it, it's very real. The state, is, the state pension system is so out of whack and it's gonna be very difficult, I think, to get this done. I think, as you heard me earlier, I think we need to get it done. And I think that will be the focus as we move forward in the next few days and weeks. Doesn't mean at all that we're ignoring this one. Any others? Going once, going twice. Yeah.